Okay, welcome to the Shelf Builders Podcast, Season 0, Episode 1. I'm Dustin Porta. I'm here with W.D. Kilpack III, and uh, we're going to talk about your bookshelf. Uh, W.D., you are you go by Bill, right? Friends call me Bill. And uh, we're in the self-published fantasy blog off together. Yep. Uh, can you tell us the name of your book and uh, a little bit about what it the series and what it's about? Well, the book that is in Smith Bow is called uh, Crown Prince. And uh, it's the first in the New Blood Saga. And it is a epic fantasy novel where uh, the main character, Nathar, is the guardian of Merrick. And to be the guardian of Merrick, he has sight. And so he is a uh, warrior and an, an advisor to kings. And one of the things that he and his father before him, who was also the guardian of Mary, um, they've been preparing for years and years for the birth of the crown prince and the fall of the current uh, reigning family and preparing to escape with the crown prince so that he could be, you know, he can grow up and, and return to uh, regaining the throne. And so crown prince starts with the birth of the crown prince. And uh, Nathar being there during the siege of the city, and it uh, basically throws you in on the deep end. And so, okay. I've had people make comments about that where, uh, when it starts, you just like, whoa, what, what's going on? What's happening? And, and I did that deliberately. I want you to be have that moment of going, what's going on? What's happening? And, and almost a, a I don't, I don't want to say frantic, but it's a feeling of what's happening or you're looking all directions at once. And uh, it seems like I mean, it's got a lot of po positive reviews. I saw on your website, you've got three or four. Is it three right now? I've got in four series? in that series that are out. Okay. And uh, book two is Order of Light. And uh, book three is Demon Seed. And book four came out in February. And it is. Oh, wow. Rewarding. Okay. And I got uh, missed four. Well, uh, I should probably get on to the uh, theme of the podcast and circle back to you telling me a little more about your books. Uh, can you describe your bookshelf for us? Uh, what it looks like? I see it behind you. And what do you use it for? Is it all books? Do you, uh, do you play board games? Any other things like that? Well, you can see my bookshelf behind me, which is 95%. Well, 90% anyway, science fiction and fantasy. And I love science fiction and fantasy, and that is what I write. Um, I also have a fair amount of uh, kind of classic literature. I have a degree in philosophy, so there is, is stuff that's also oh, okay. uh, philosophical, a little bit of uh, theology. I have some, uh, I love comic books. And so, well, you see some of the, the, uh, figurines that are up there my first... have you been growing this since you were young or are most of the books on these shelves in your office uh recent purchases since the office came to be well the books since i was a kid that uh growing up we didn't have a lot of money and so but one of the things with that is that where i didn't have a lot of toys and stuff if i asked for a book the answer was never no and so that was one of the things. And, and so my parents were very supportive that way. And, and I've always been sort of a storyteller. And I think that maybe my parents saw something. I was published for the first time when I was nine. And so I think that maybe gave them a hint of something, something where uh, they said, if he wants a book, I think we're going to say yes. And so I guess in a way, books were my toys. And so I have a lot of one of my first dream job was uh, to be a, a, a cartoonist. I wanted to open my own comic book company and either work for Marvel or take them out. There's books. a tendency to bounce around when you're an author. You you have these fixations on things. At least I do. I I think I, there was a period where I really wanted to be in comics, and then I didn't get very far. Uh, so. Has it always looked like this, or did you get it together uh, during the pandemic when everyone started Skype calling and Zooming? Where you like, 
I need to take my shelves and turn them into a backdrop for me as well. Well, before we did, my wife and I did remodel this room to make it an office, and that was prior to COVID. And so those bookshelves back there, um, I did build into the wall. And so they were separate bookshelves, but now they're built in. And that was something to find a home for my books. However, I do have more bookshelves throughout the house. But that, you know, was something to, uh, you know, for my books and memorabilia and, and things like that. I love music. So I've got some books that are all about uh, some of my favorite bands. And I've got, you can't see them on screen probably, but I've got some Todd McFarlane Kiss figurines and because I love, love Todd McFarlane. Yeah. yeah. And so I've got a lot of stuff that I have collected over the years. And, and so the shelves are also to show off some of that stuff or at least have it where I can see it rather than it being, you know, in boxes or in, in a cabinet somewhere where I can enjoy it. And so the thing as far as COVID and, and I taught college for 25 years and when COVID hit, then I needed to have a, uh, something that was presentable when I was teaching over, uh, you know, teaching online. My desk was over on this side, which showed a closet that was ugly. So that changed the office design because this was much more attractive than that closet uh, that was loaded full of junk. So that was something along the lines of what you were talking about. And now, of course, the my wife and I share the office and our desks are on the same wall now. So are you like me where you kind of have a, uh, I've read this shelf and an aspirational shelf? This side, I haven't read. This side, I have read. Okay. So you have a system then. Yeah. I When I was getting my master's, I managed uh, the flagship store of a national bookstore chain. And that meant I had a deep discount. And I have stacks of books that as many years as have passed, I still haven't read yet. So that deep <laughs> discount was... Uh, a blessing and a curse because you know that when I write my sci-fi I do a lot of research and so I have books about like quantum physics and things like that that I've looked into some of the stuff that I was looking at specifically but I haven't you know read the whole book and then there's other stuff that I, when I was reading I was like really got interested and then I, I did actually read it I did that with a uh, anatomy book once that I was looking at it for my comic book drawing, and then I ended up just reading. Are there any that you uh, keep coming back to and have read, reread from year to year? Uh, any of my books? Is that yeah, I don't do a lot of rereading personally. I if I read a book, I'm done with it. There's a few that I'm waiting to go back to, uh, but I don't do a ton of rereading. A few things I read when I was a kid, I've reread it as, as an that some people will reread the same book every year. Um, there isn't stuff that I reread every year, but there are some that I reread just because it, it had such an impression on me. Uh, Tolkien, I've read uh, the, both The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. The Hobbit, I've probably read a dozen times. The Lord of the Rings, I've read from front, you know, from beginning to end a half dozen times. Uh, Eric Van Lusbader, his book. Uh, the Sunset Warrior, I've read a, a half dozen times, but not the rest of the trilogy. The first book I just really, I've never really heard of the first Eric book. Fendler. I'm going to write that down. He did primarily uh, kind of Japanese historical fiction, but he did a sci fi slash fantasy series called the Sunset Warrior trilogy. And the first book, The Sunset Warrior, I love. But the books after that, I don't love as much. And so The Sunset Warrior, just by itself, I've read a half dozen times. And then um, another one that's not sci-fi or fantasy that I've read uh, three times anyway is, is Plato's Republic. And so, you know, go okay. figure. that's just kind of out there. And that's one that I, I read it. Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, I think it's the Symposium I've, I've read three or four times. Uh, the Republic maybe one and a half. Yeah, they, that I one, really like Plato. Yeah, you know, I, I read it the first time on a dare in <laughs> eighth grade, and I it was torture. And mm -hmm. the, the one thing I remember about it, other than hatred, 
was, uh, what does the cave have to do with anything? And just fuming. And, you know, I was 14. And the thing is, is that your brain continues to develop until you're an adult. And I then when I was 19 and I read just the metaphor of the cave, it was like angels singing in the shaft of sunlight coming through the ceiling and striking me and leaving me forever changed. Because it, when I was 19, my brain had developed where I could think uh, abstractly. And when I was 14, I couldn't. And it was like this perfect thing because it's considered like the most perfect metaphor ever written. And when I was 14, I didn't get it. It was just annoying that it went on and on and on. And that was the only thing I remember from when I was 14. When I was 19, it was so amazing. And that's why I've read it several times. Are you uh, better at arguments because you've read so much Plato? He has that Socratic method that just goes round and round. I, I well, assume it drives other people crazy. But, uh, I, I, I can debate that. And it's more because of Aristotle. That uh, with his work with syllogism, but yeah, I I can argue, I can debate, and uh, I took a logic class in in getting my undergrad that I did love. I would have taken advanced logic, but so few people wanted it, they didn't offer it frequently enough for me to take it before I graduated. That's interesting. Um, I should keep things moving here. Uh, okay, ten minutes in, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, but moving on from the bookshelves. As, as much color as there is back there to distract me and other things I want to ask about. Uh, I, I believe I asked, I, I believe I warned you that I was going to ask you to talk about a specific book that wasn't your own. Uh, so I guess, is there a book that you've read recently or, or you're reading right now or something that you grew up reading that, uh, that you're excited to talk about that you wouldn't mind sharing, uh, like a mini review of? Well, there were certain books that I read, uh, actually when I was fairly young, that, that was a genre. One of the things when I was in elementary school, I, I don't know how it started. I started reading mythology. And that really had an influence on me, Greek mythology in particular. And then hmm. uh, Roman mythology, of course, is just a repackaging of, of Greek mythology. The Romans didn't yeah. do a lot of thinking of their own as far as that goes. They just kind of, you know, rebranded it. But uh, I loved mythology. And so I read every mythology book that my elementary school had in their li in the library. I read all of them. And it, so that branched out a little bit beyond there. And, and I have quite a few books on mythology. I was studying Celtic mythology for a lot of years when it was really hard to find. Now it's kind of in vogue, so you can find it easily. Right? Yeah, uh, there's a few like YouTube channels that are they they push people to uh, get a better understanding of it and work it into their fiction. There's a few like Celtic mythology should be a focus of your fantasy fiction uh, YouTube shows that I've seen mm -hmm. here and there. I, I think that's a good thing for the genre as long as we don't all write the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, if 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 you know your Celtic uh, mythology and if you know your Celtic culture, then you can probably see it in the New Blood Saga. It's at a deep level, and it you know it's it's at the foundation. But it's I didn't want it to be obvious, and I have had a few people say, "Is that based on some you know this or that?" And I was like, "Yeah, a little." It was inspired. Does anybody well, just spontaneously turn into a salmon? That no. No, okay. and uh, nothing like that. It's that's, it's that's it's my favorite not, bit. It, I would say it's more inspired by than than based on, but there is something to that. And I I there's another series that was inspired by uh, Viking culture. So I did a lot of research into it. It's, a, it's not published yet, but uh, and it was okay. amazing the influence that Viking culture had on the world. And it do you have a an example? Oh. Uh, I was going to say, do you have an ETA on that? How's the writing going for you? Um, I haven't finished the series. One of the things with with series is I like to write the whole series before uh, I publish because you develop things as you're going through. And so, like with the New Blood Saga, I wrote all eight books before I published the first one. 
and because mm-hmm. I develop things as I go and then I weave them back in, you know, because have you tried doing it the other way and seeing how difficult it can be? Yes, I have. And so, uh, when I if I write them all, because there's stuff that, especially if it's just really flowing, like mm-hmm. with the new Blood Saga, it was just coming, it was just coming out, and so there was stuff that I knew that I would develop later. So I just kind of got the basic idea down and moved on because I knew that I developed it later. And then there was stuff later that then I did. And so then when I was revising that I re kind of wove that in uh, where, you know, we got expanded upon and fleshed out. So my next question was going to be, tell me about what you've been writing, but you kind of did that already. Uh, is there any uh, particular place in the canon or any writers that you, you're just fond of that you're like, I like to think my book's out there leaning up against their book somewhere. Uh, well, of course, there's the, you know, the masters, the, the uh, you know, Tolkien, uh, Martin, uh, Eddings, uh, Jordan, you know, th- th- there's a lot of those names that are that are the ones that people always think about when they think fantasy. Another one that mm-hmm. may is not as big but was an inspiration to me was S. M. Sterling. And I met him at a con and I did not think that uh it was possible for me to geek out, but I did. <laughs> and I was tongue tied and goofy and I find and he was he was very patient, but he uh I finally just told him, I said, I'm sorry, I'm geeking out, and uh, you've been inspirational to me. And when I told him that, he goes, oh, been there. And then he was just, he just waited for me to get it together. And (laughs) then he finally said, so, well, why are you here? And I had some bookmarks that I'd made, because at that time I had two books out, and I showed it to him. And he got so excited, and he looked at it, and he pulled out his laptop, and pulled up my books and got them right there. And he hit the enter key and said, done. And I was just like, <gasps> you know, and, and, but with his writing at that time, when I was a teenager, he was really pushing the envelope. And I, I, I haven't heard of S.M. Sterling before. Uh, will you tell me what genre he's in and some of, some of the books that he's written and what, sci-fi, what his style's like? Sci-fi and fantasy. And, at the time, the one of the things that he did, which now isn't as, as big a deal, but when I was a teenager, um, he was the first time that I ever saw uh, characters that were, uh, well, like there was, there was one series of books where there were two female characters that were lesbians. And I was like, you can do that? <laughs> and I literally, the first time I saw it, that I read something like that, I went, whoa, 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 whoa. And I went back and reread it just to make sure that it actually is that did I just read what I thought I read and reread it. It's like, whoa, because it, it just I I didn't think that that it was OK to do that. And and he also was one of the first that I saw writing characters that were women in what were traditionally female er, that were traditionally male roles. And so he had a lot of women that were. Uh, very strong uh, warrior types, very strong characters that uh, was one of the reasons that I loved like James Cameron movies. And in James Cameron movies, there's always a very strong female character. And that was one of the things that he did also. And when I talked to him, I told him about that, how he uh, made, made me realize, he kind of gave me permission to write things that were more pushing the envelope. And I real made me realize that if you are not pushing the envelope, you're probably not being original. And when I told him that, he sat back like I hadn't <laughs> thought about it like that before. And then he just got this big smile and he says, you know, I, I think you're right. <laughs> and it was just this cool moment. And, but it's at that Cool. At that con, he was the number two guy. The, the number one guy was Kevin J. Anderson. And, oh, yep. And so, uh, but you know, he's one of the the guys that in, that inspires me and and 
he's written a, a lot of sci-fi and fantasy, some military sci-fi and, and stuff. He, he's, you know, he kind of is rides the spectrum in, part, in terms of those two uh, genres. You said you've written a little bit of both. Are you kind of stepping back from sci-fi right now and focusing more on the fantasy, or do you bounce around from day to day? Um, well, I've been focusing a lot on the New Blood saga because, you know, I want to get those out. But I also, my fifth book that's out is a uh, sci-fi novella called Pale Face. And uh, that is, uh, it got honorable mention in the L. Ron Hubbard's Writers of the Future contest. And which I'm oh, told cool. is pretty hard to crack. But That's a big deal, yeah. I wrote it for that competition, and uh, and it is in the Sphinx competition, the the indie novella competition right now. It's one of the hundred books that's in that. And uh, so that is a sci-fi novella. And right now, I am working on uh, at this moment a sci-fi novel that I'm hoping to get out this fall, and it's called Battle Column. So it's my most pressing uh, work in progress, and it's a post-apocalyptic uh, sci-fi. Uh, well, I, I don't want to say dystopian because it's kind of beyond that. I'm really working hard to get out. I want to get it out this fall, and that's a sci-fi. Okay, we have a few minutes here still, but uh, uh, I wanted to ask you. Uh, where can people find you? I'm going to post it uh, in the, the show notes as well. But uh, your website, uh, tell us about Crown Prince again. And uh, mention what blog is uh, is your spiff boat judge as well. Our website is killpack.net. That's K-I-L-P-A-C-K dot net. And that's, I'm on all kinds of social media also, but that's kind of the hub of my dreams. All this yeah, there's a, there's a lot on there. It's it's really well done. Oh, I, I appreciate that. And so that's that everything radiates out from there, and it's got purchase links and all that because I'm on all kinds of of the uh, sales platforms, Amazon and Kobo and Nook and all. I that. like your merch, by the way. I really like the uh, you have the, like the the Celtic, Irish quotes on mm -hmm. uh, both on some of your merch and stuff. Celtic, I like yeah. that. That's appeals to people who haven't read your books as well as your readers. I thought that was cool. Yeah, I I just like that stuff that uh, it's been appealing to me. Something a long you wanted time. for yourself, and exactly yeah. that's it's the kind of stuff that I it's it's like they say write the books that you would like to read. Well, I designed some <laughs> yeah. things that I would like to wear or own, and I did I applied the same concepts. So so hopefully there are people that are like minded and see that. Um, uh, do you have any board games on your bookshelves? Are you a board gamer I, at all? I play. That's going to be the other fifty percent of this show. Is I, I'm in some board game design communities. I'm going to bring some board gamers on as well. I do play some board games, but I play more tabletop role playing games. Uh, I play a same, lot of same space. D and D and Marvel superheroes, but I stick more to the the older stuff. That I still play uh, advanced D and D first and second edition. Um, I played it with all my kids. My youngest boy and I just played last night, uh, the la well, all weekend, really. And we have revised some of the rules to update and integrate. Um, we write, uh, we update character classes, all the, a lot of stuff like that. Um, we are writing our own RPG, and it's a sci-fi RPG. And we... But and we've done the same thing with the Marvel superheroes, with the classic Marvel superheroes. There's other versions since then, but going through That's and awesome. updating and expanding and and uh, basically, I've played at least uh, probably at least a dozen uh, tabletop RPGs. I have a cabinet that's dedicated to it. Uh, that Glad has, I asked. That. Okay, uh, has uh, six shelves and and doors, and it's. It's next to the, the kitchen table. If you ever are looking for a new podcast, there's one called uh, All Fiction is Fantasy, and it's by a guy called The Dungeon Dive. He's a YouTuber. Uh, oh. His YouTube's about solitaire role-playing games. He house rules RPGs so he can play by himself, and he reviews them. Uh, but his 
his podcast is reviewing uh, old sword and sorcery novels and old sci-fi from the, the golden age. Uh, and it's, it's just starting out. That's pretty cool and worth a listen. Uh, but if you, if you like that, you know, and, you know, Conan era type stuff as well. Oh, yeah. Um, That's where Robert Jordan but, started. Yeah. Yeah. The two first Conan movies were written by Robert Jordan. Were written where they oh, were really? they were based on novels by Robert Jordan. Hmm. Did not know that. I had no idea. Uh, awesome. We're, we're right on time here. I wanted to ask you one more question, and that was your. Uh, tell me about your Spiffbo. Uh, oh, you're you're in two. You're in the Spiffbo, and you also have a sci-fi novel in another contest. Will you tell me what blogs are judging you and, and where people can follow that? Well, on Spit, uh, Spiffbo, it's uh, Philip Chase. And That's the self-published fantasy blog off. Speculative fiction, indie, novella, championship is Sphinx. And I'll, uh, I'll drop the link in the show notes. And thanks for coming on and uh, showing us your bookshelves. And uh, It's killpack.net. And uh, kill pack with one L. Yeah, this was fun. I enjoyed it. And, um, <laughs> well, and I'm honored that uh, you know that you thought of me. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. All right, Bill. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us. And we'll uh, okay. we'll need some kind of uh, slogan to to end on. I don't have one yet. <laughs> Keep your bookshelves right. dry. <laughs>